Welcome to IVF This, episode 128, IVF and Secondary Losses. Hello, 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 my beautiful friends. I hope you're all doing so, so well today. I have actually been thinking about this episode and have been meaning to do it for at, at least a year and a half. Like, I've been thinking about secondary losses as it pertains to like infertility and IVF for a long time, probably even before I pivoted my coaching practice from like general life coaching to IVF and infertility. And for reasons passing understanding, I just haven't sat down to do this particular episode, even though I, I know it's the, one of the most relevant experiences that we have in terms of how we expected our life to go. I know I've talked about that on the podcast and how loss can just the idea of going through IVF or the act of going through IVF can it can be an experience of loss because it kind of goes against how we expected our family journey, family planning, family making experience to be. Um, so I, I'm so glad that I'm finally doing it. <laughs> let's, let's just be honest. I'm glad that I can check this one off my to-do list. I don't have to keep a mental note of it because I think this is going to be very, very relevant to a lot of you guys. So as with everything with IVF This, cafeteria style, if this resonates for you, wonderful. If it doesn't, wonderful too. So to understand secondary losses, you have to understand primary losses. So a primary loss is, an, in the way that most people think of primary losses, are the miscarriage or the member of your family passing away, a friend passing away, uh, being fired from a job. That could be a primary loss. Uh, filing for bankruptcy. So there are a lot of examples. And I think people can understand the big loss, quote unquote, the big loss, right? But that's what we would consider in like the therapeutic world to be the primary loss. Okay. The secondary loss is all of the little things that maybe you considered, but didn't really think about, or maybe even didn't even consider them to be things until you suffered the primary loss. So secondary losses are those, but predominantly they're the things that would never have happened if that primary loss had never occurred. So let me give you an example from my, my own infertility experience, my own IVF journey. So there was a moment after our failed transfer in July of 2020, that was the primary loss. Okay. I, I want to make sure that I point that out. So the primary loss for us was the failed transfer in August, July, something like that of 2020. And then throughout the fall, as you know, I really wanted to go back to another IVF round. I was, I was so ready. I was so just, I fought so hard uh, to go through another round and my husband just wasn't. There's no fault of his. It was his own experience, his own grief, his own reconciliation, but he was not ready for that. So an aspect of secondary loss for me was we a little bit drifted apart. I've talked a, a little bit about that, how that fall and, and kind of the fallout of that was a really difficult, I want to say challenging, but it was a difficult part time. It was a difficult time in our marriage. And so one of the secondary losses that occurred for me was we lost a little bit of our connection. We have since regained it and are stronger and, and better together now, but that was a form of a, a secondary loss. That was a secondary loss for us. Connection. One of my friends growing up, she was my best friend growing up, as we kind of got older and we both married different people and I moved across the state of Texas uh, with my husband, we sort of drifted apart. And she had gone, she had started on a path of like adoption and she wasn't really sure she wanted to have her own biological children and I fully supported that. And she was kind of in her own, uh, she was kind of in her own experience in her own journey of learning how to be a foster. You've got to take all these classes, do background checks. And she was very, very excited about it. And she got a placement pretty quickly. And all of that time was also the time that I was going through just primary infertility. So we, we had been trying for about seven to eight months. I was getting very, very depressed. I was getting very, very anxious. I was going through my own experiences. 
And I think at a certain point it overlapped where she had kiddos for a, a long period of time, like several, several months, maybe even a year. And so she was doing the mom thing. And I was just, I was just devastated. I was walking around with my heart on my sleeve all the time. People were telling us all, people were telling me all the things that people say, you know, you just need to relax. It'll happen when you least expect it, blah, 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 blah. But I was just walking around like this open, raw, exposed nerd. And I couldn't even speak to her about her experience as, as a foster mom. The thing that she wanted to do, and she was, she was, I knew she was going to be a phenomenal mom. She is a phenomenal mom. And I just, even in that aspect of it, knowing that that was a temporary situation, knowing that, you know, we, we both had our own journeys. I just could not even fathom having a conversation and even hearing kids in the background of a phone call. Now, that is one of many reasons that we're not as close as we used to be. I'm also a pretty terrible long distance friend. <laughs> my ADHD, you know, the, the out of sight, out of mind thing. My love for her is, is a deep and as raw as it always has been. I'm just not really good at keeping in touch with people. But that aside, but that's a form of a secondary loss. The way that our friendships, the way that our relationships change throughout this journey, throughout this experience, that is a form of a secondary loss. Seeing birth announcements or pregnancy announcements, gender reveals, baby showers, those are forms of secondary losses. Even if you already have a child of your own, through whatever means you got that child, if you are experiencing that as a loss, that sadness, that grief, that dread of attending if you were invited, all of that is a form of a secondary loss because it's an example of if you weren't in this particular situation, if you hadn't experienced that loss, whether it was the loss of the expectation, you're going through infertility, which is its own loss. Maybe you've had miscarriages. Maybe you've experienced failed transfers or failed cycles. Maybe you're about to embark on IVF after a few years of kind of just waiting to see what was going to happen, but it was still an excruciating time. Those are all primary losses. So the secondary losses of, God, I get to watch everyone else have their happy ending or have their happy family. And I don't, I don't get that. And that's grief. You know, it can look like a lot of things. It can look like anger. It can look like resentment. It can look like jealousy. It can look like sadness. But those are examples of secondary losses. The many Christmases I sat around thinking, God, if my Christmas would look very different if I got my family, if I had the family that I dreamed of, that I wanted, that's a form of a secondary loss, right? These holidays that, and these family get togethers and things like that, that we idealize in our minds as something that's going to be so joyful and so filled with love because of the children that we desire, the family that we desire, and we don't have that. That's a form of a secondary loss. And the reason that I want to spend so much time talking and, and giving examples is because most of these things people wrap up in like, oh, this is a, this is a terrible part of this journey, which it is. But I think that if we allow ourselves context for why it's so hard, that it truly is a form of grieving. It is a form of a loss then I think it can help us understand it. It doesn't take the sting out of it. And I, I know I talk about that a lot. Like I can't take the pain away from you. I can't. I wish I could. With every fiber of my being, I wish I could. But I can't. That That is for kind of you alone to navigate and learn because it's so specific to you. But I think if we allow ourselves to have kind of that context and understand, oh, I had this expectation in my mind for a long time or, or like as in reference to like holidays, I had this expectation in my mind for a long time about how my Christmases or my Hanukkahs or what, whatever the holiday is, whatever the, the celebration is, I had it in my mind for what it was going to look like. And it looks very different from that. And that's painful. God, that's so painful. You're not doing anything wrong because you dread the, the, holiday season coming upon us. I mean, I know that you're going to hear this in 
August, maybe even to September. I can't remember. I'm pretty far ahead. My producers has worked me pretty hard over the last few weeks. But the holiday season is just right around the corner. I mean, we're we're coming into like the start of school. That's another one. You're going to start seeing kiddos walk into school, going to daycare, playing at parks more, things like that. that's a form of a secondary loss. I have this client. She lives, I think she said like a mile and a half from the beach in LA. I love this woman. I absolutely adore her. She's a, 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 a resiliency I, I, I could only hope to have. But she talks about how she lives a mile and a half from the beach and she can't go there because there's moms and strollers and babies there all the time. That is a form of a secondary loss, right? Not just the fact that kind of losing out of that experience, she has a choice and she knows it's a choice. So that's not what we're talking about. Like we, we know she could choose to go to the beach and just work on that. But the secondary loss in that she doesn't feel like she can at this moment right now go there and that be a safe kind of psychologically and emotionally experience for her, right? That's a form of a secondary loss. Being so close to wanting to do something and not doing it. Missing out on maybe get-togethers with friends because they have children and you don't. Or they have two children and you don't. You want to. And you don't want all of the conversations around pregnancy and babies and new babies and siblings and things like that. That's, that's a secondary loss. There, and there are some like innocuous ones that you would never even consider. Well, you know, I was telling you a little bit about when our transfer failed in like the late summer of 2020. And I remember it was like Christmas Eve or very close to Christmas Eve, maybe like December 22nd, 23rd, something like that of that same year. And I was walking through Target and all of a sudden I had this thought of like, oh, cause it was, a, I saw a really cute dress. <laughs> it was like a holiday dress in the maternity section at Target. And I had this moment of like, oh, God, I would have loved to have worn that dress. I wanted to wear that dress. I thought it would look beautiful for my little pregnant belly that I wanted to have so desperately. And that was a, that was a form of a secondary loss, right? We, we kind of go through these, you know, online catalogs or we look at like Carter's or Target and we imagine how we would dress our cute or we imagine how we would cutely dress our kids or how we would decorate our nursery. And so maybe going by clothing aisles or going to a home decor store or a baby decor store, if you're really feeling uh, masochistic in that moment. But, but wanting that and seeing it and not being able to, or feeling like you can't get it. That's a form of a secondary loss. And that's why it's so painful. Like I think that, and, and when I talk about the three ways that I, I think that we can kind of navigate those things. But I, I think that the reason that those can be so hard on us, right? There's, uh, there's the primary pain of it being a secondary loss. I love using a bunch of the words <laughs> all the same in, during a, the podcast to confuse you guys. But, you know, there's the primary pain of having that secondary loss. And then, then there's the conversation that we have with ourselves. What the hell's wrong with me? <laughs> I can't believe I'm, I can't believe I can't even walk the halls of Target and not get upset. That was one that I told myself, right? I can't believe that I just can't get my shit together so I can go spend time with my friends or my family. Or I can't believe that I can't keep my shit together when I'm spending time with my friends or my family, right? It's the conversation that we're having with ourselves. So that leads me to the three things, the three ways that you can kind of navigate secondary losses. They are inevitable. They are inevitable. Secondary, if you have a primary loss in your life inside of infertility or IVF, and of course, outside of infertility and IVF, you're going to experience secondary losses. Okay. A secondary loss that maybe, maybe doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with IVF or infertility, but like this one, I never really thought of until I experienced it. But you have a job that you love, right? You love the work, you love the people, 
And then because a really good offer came along, maybe a promotion or uh, better working conditions or whatever, like you get to work from home or you want to work in an office and vice versa, but not getting to go to that job every day and see those people that you love. I had never considered that to be a primary secondary loss until I left one of the hospitals that I worked at here in Austin. And I had worked there for just under three years. And when I tell you that I loved the people that I worked with, I loved the people that I worked with. The work was the same. Like it had always been, you know, healthcare administration, case management, things like that. Social work, all of that had been kind of in that role, baked into that role. And I loved the role. It was, it was just the work that I did. But the people, oh, I loved those people. And it was a very hard decision for me to leave. It was, it was an amazing promotion. It was a lot more money than I was already making. I had a lot more flexibility with my, that position, the new one. And I never even considered it to be a loss like that. Right. And that's why I think that primary and secondary losses, the way that we think about them, it always has to do with death. That's like the, how the vast majority of people think about losses. But there, there's so many things in the middle between birth and death where you can experience those primary and secondary losses. And that's why I think it's so important to talk about it. So, okay. So these are inevitable. You're going to experience. Here's how I think you can be a little bit kinder to yourself. Process these things a little bit easier. Make the experience of them a little bit easier. So the first one is I want you to acknowledge and validate. Nothing is wrong with you. You're not broken. You're not malfunctioning. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. You're experiencing a secondary loss. Whether you can logically, like I, I know logically this was not, you know, it doesn't make sense that I would be so upset about this. Bye-bye baby. There's a massive store in the United States and it's recently closing or it is closing. I had a client talk about how she saw she drove by on the interstate and she saw the store closing sign on Bye Bye Baby. She said she just burst into tears because she had always imagined she, it was like on her way to work or something. So she saw it very frequently and she hadn't heard of the bankruptcy or anything like that. But she said she just, she just lost it in the car. She just started to scream crying and she couldn't figure out why. Well, it was, it was, it was clear. Not obvious. I would never use the word obvious because that means that she should have seen it. But when we were talking about it, it was clear to me what was happening. When, when she talked about, you know, I had always imagined picking out my jogging stroller there. It wasn't that the store was closing, right? She, she, by my understanding, she'd never shopped there, but she had this vision in her mind of, you know, going and having this nice, beautiful little round belly. And her and her partner were going to go and, and put everything on the registry or shop for the things that they want, or even just kind of roam the halls in that like eager, loving anticipation of pregnancy. Right. And, and she, she was like, you know, I, logically it doesn't make any sense. And I was like, it doesn't have to make sense. <laughs> we're not, this isn't an intellect thing. Right. Of course. Like, I want you guys to really hear me when I say this. When you tell yourself it doesn't make sense or it's, or I logically know something, just throw it out the window. We're not talking about logic here. That is, that's not even relevant to the conversation. Logic need not apply in this situation when you're in the throes of the emotion. Okay. Not only physiologically can you not access logic when you are in the throes of those types of emotions. Uh, like that's just not accessible to you, but it's also not a logic issue, right? It's, it's expectation, it's desire, it's longing, desperation. Those are not those. I, I don't know that most people would consider them to be like logical emotions. I don't think there's a logic to any, I think they are two sides of the same coin, logic and emotion. I think we often use logic against ourselves when we're experiencing emotion. So like, I don't necessarily ascribe to that, but I think a lot of people do. A lot of people think that if you're experiencing an emotion, you should be able to out logic it. And that's, they don't, 
<laughs> they don't work that way. <laughs> they just don't, you, you can work with them together. I think that's a beautiful harmony. But again, when you're in the throes of emotion, logic is not going to be accessible to you. Okay. So the, the most loving thing, not the most logical, remember not invited. The most loving thing you can do to yourself for yourself is to acknowledge and validate. Even just question, am I, is this a secondary loss? Is that what I'm feeling? Right? Maybe I'm angry. Maybe I'm jealous. Maybe I'm resentful. Maybe I'm really, really freaking sad. Could it be a secondary loss? Could it be that I had imagined, you know, walking my baby in a stroller along the park and letting them run in and, and seeing all those kids at the park right now is so painful. You know, is that what that could be? So allow yourself to like have that moment of like, Hey, maybe it's not that I'm crazy. Maybe it's not that I'm ungrateful. Maybe it's not that, you know, I can never be happy. Maybe it's, I'm actually experiencing a loss right now and I can name that. And it makes sense. It, it always makes sense. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, for the, mm, it always makes sense until the day that I die, I'm going to scream out. Your emotions make sense when you stop judging them and you can offer your brain some context as to why you're thinking what you're thinking. Your emotions make sense. They just do. So ask yourself, even if you're not certain, if you, even if you can't name it specifically, ah, yes, I am experiencing a secondary loss right now just to offer yourself the option. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what I'm experiencing. Okay. So that's number one. You want to acknowledge and validate. Number two, being willing to feel it, right? You don't have to like set up a, a, a yogic practice where you're, you know, in a meditative trance and right exactly where you are. But even just that aspect of validating and allowing yourself to be like, oh, okay. This is grief. I don't like feeling grief, but that's what I need to do in this moment. And, and if you need some more support with that or help with that, one of the first episodes I did, I think it was in the first 10 episodes I did, so almost two and a half years ago, is uh, an, a, it's a podcast episode called Feel Better Now that kind of talks about how to process your emotions, like opening up to them, describing them. I'm going to do a few more podcasts, kind of an updated version over the next several months of a, a few different ways of some alternative ways to processing. Because I think sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating to just sit there and feel that emotion, right? And you don't have to, it doesn't have to look exactly like that. It can be playing a sad song in your car, so that it kind of helps you get that out. That's not distracting yourself. That's not not doing the work. It's just allowing yourself some other thing instead of just sitting there with your thoughts and feeling like that is too overwhelming to access. It could be getting out and moving your body, right? I can't tell you how many runs I went on throughout various losses in my life where I just cried. Like it was, it was messy. <laughs> it was very strange. Cause you know, when you cry, your nose runs and you're running and it was messy. It was awkward. And yet it was exactly what I needed. So there's a lot of different ways. I don't, I don't want you to get overwhelmed with like, Oh, another person telling me to feel my feelings and a, I don't know how to do that. Or B that seems too really, that seems too scary. There, there are other options. Move, just moving your body, right? Maybe the option is for you to shut down for a little bit. Allow yourself the opportunity and the space to cry or go to sleep if that's what your body needs. Your body's always going to tell you what it needs. You just have to be willing to ask it and listen. Okay. So number one, acknowledge and validate. Number two is willing to feel. Number three is what, nope, is who do you want to be? All right. And I know this that might seem like a really serious, I know this might seem like a really silly question, but the idea is who do you want to be? when those secondary losses show up. Do you want to be the person that beats the shit out of herself? That judges the feeling? That that just craps on all the things that you've experienced and navigated and tries to chalk it up to it's illogical or there's something wrong with me. I'm just a terrible person. I can't even be happy for other people because I don't have my thing. Is that 
is that how you want to choose to treat yourself? You can, and you probably have, because I, I know your girl here has many times I've chosen that path, but is that who you want to be? Or do you want to be the woman, the person that says, Hey, (laughs) this is a really freaking hard moment, right? Maybe it's a secondary loss. Maybe not. Maybe, but maybe it is. And, and I can see how this fits in and gosh, I don't want it to be this way, but here we are. I think I talked a few weeks about tolerance versus acceptance. (sighs) I don't want this the way that it is, but I know that this is my life and I know I don't have to be hard on myself. I know that I can be the person who knows that this is part of grief and that everybody's grief looks different and that there's no wrong way to grieve and that I'm doing the best that I can. What I'm asking you is I want you to kind of imagine while you're kind of listening to this episode, I want you to imagine a scenario that could catch you up, right? Maybe you're going out with some friends that you know are moms. Maybe you are, you have just received or are about to receive an invitation for a baby shower, gender reveal, or something. If you want to go to those things, then who do you want to be in those moments? Because they're going to be hard, more than likely. Not completely hard. They're also going to be probably lovely and exciting and and therapeutic in some ways, but they're probably also going to be hard. So how, who do you want to be? How do you want to treat yourself in the moments where it's hard? Right? Maybe, maybe you're going to decide to go to the bathroom and have a moment where you like scream internally. (laughs) Done that many times as well. And then you go back out there and, and you're able to kind of ground yourself from that right? Maybe you want to be the person who just supports themselves without like the toxic positivity crap or anything like that. But just you're, you're going to be someone who supports herself. You're going to be someone who lets them experience an emotion when it's happening, staying present in the, in the moment that you don't have to run from them. You don't have to like overeat or over drink or shop or anything like that to, to try to numb the feeling. You don't need to numb it, but just someone who says, I can love myself through this process. I don't have to make it harder on myself. This it's okay that it's here, right? It's okay that I am experiencing this type of loss. And I think that when we can get to that particular moment, that moment of like, okay, this is what's happening. It's, you know, grief isn't like a super comfortable emotion, but it's familiar enough to me right now. I know it's not going to kill me. feels like it can sometimes. I'm never going to take that away from someone. It's not going to kill me. And I can choose to show up and just be gentle with myself. If nothing else, I can be gentle with myself. If nothing else, I can say, you know, when my brain offers me, I should be, I should be handling this better. I'm handling it how I'm handling it. When your brain says you need to go do something productive right now, maybe not, maybe that could be helpful. If it seems dreadful, then maybe that's not the answer, right? Maybe your brain is like, oh, we can't lay around all day just because we're sad. Maybe you can, maybe you can. If the, the entirety of earth's civilization is resting on your shoulders, maybe not, but if that's not the case, if no one is going to die or suffer because you lay on the couch, for a day, half a day, a couple of hours, then maybe that's exactly what you need. And you don't have to bully yourself into doing something quote unquote productive or doing something you don't want to do when you're experiencing that grief. And I think that that's, that's an added aspect of compassion that I I don't know that I have done the best job of describing, but I will moving forward. Okay, my friends, that is what I have for you today hope you have a beautiful week and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of IVF This. If you like what you've heard, click subscribe and follow to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you want to learn more, head over to www.ivfthiscoaching.com to learn how to work together.